pleasure to welcome here Tomáš Mikolov. I don't think it's necessary to introduce him. He used to work for Microsoft, for Google. Now he's employed by Facebook and he's well known uh, as the author of, of the word to vec algorithm. So welcome here. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so now I'm working at the Facebook AI research team. My talk will be about uh, distributed representations for natural language processing. It will be, I would say, much simpler than the previous talks about uh, like the basic concepts. Uh, maybe it will be a bit boring to, for some people from the scientific point of view, but I hope that uh, the story will be at least slightly interesting. So the talk is short, just this half an hour. I will talk about like uh, the word to vec thing, uh, uh, which I think is like uh, now used in uh, many places. I will try to explain like uh, why is it uh, useful, why did I develop it, and why other people will actually think about similar ideas before. Uh, I will try to describe how uh, these models are trained, how they are uh, evaluated, and some motivational examples to show that uh, they can do a lot. Uh, but they cannot definitely do everything. And in the end, I will have some short discussion of uh, what were the follow-up results that were published uh, later uh, after I did publish these papers at Google in 2013. So for the motivation, uh, there are like many uh, important uh, real-world applications uh, that uh, involve text in some way. Uh, for example, uh, Google search or like search in general, uh, ads recommendation which uh, makes all the money for like uh, these big companies uh, these days, uh, and the ranking, spam filtering, uh, there's really many applications where some representation of the text is very important and impacts the, uh, the quality of the application uh, in a big way. Uh, so two main groups of the representations I would say are like are the local representations or the continuous representations. For the local ones, uh, they are like these uh, well-known like engrams, uh, back of words or back of engrams representations. Uh, the like uh, basic concept is this one of encoding, which means that uh, we build a dictionary of words uh, from the text that we are using, and then we encode each word as uh, basically a, a vector that is orthogonal to other words, so that's that's the one of encoding. It has uh, some advantages and some disadvantages. Uh, the continuous representations are somewhat different. I will try to explain in a while what these mean. Uh, the most famous ones are probably like the latent semantic analysis, the latent Dirichlet allocation, and then the distributed, repre distributed representations that I will be talking about. So for the motivation, like why would be uh, why would uh, we want to consider such representations? Uh, suppose that you want to quickly build a classifier. For example, you are working in a company and you are given a new task and you have like two days to accomplish the task. Or maybe you are working in a startup and want to get something quickly. So you will get some input uh, text, which can be say some keyword uh, or it can be a user query. And you are supposed to build some classifier that will uh, say, for example, if the keyword uh, was a capital city of some country or not, so just a binary classifier. Uh, well, you can of course get uh, the training data, but that uh, takes time and uh, it can even cost a lot of money if you need human annotators to annotate the examples with the labels. Uh, uh, and it can be definitely like uh, time consuming. With the local representations, you will need many training examples and the system can actually memorize uh, easily the answers. For example, if you will just show to the system uh, training data of this type that you will say that uh, Rome and Prague are capital cities while Turkey and Australia are not, you can have like plenty of words of this type and some of, the, some of them can be labeled as capital cities, some of them not. If you will train just uh, like say, for example, as a linear SVM or logistic regression on top of uh, uh, such one of N representations, then uh, the system will not generalize at all. It will be just able to remember what you did uh, tell it. So can we actually build a good classifier just from these like few examples, like five or 10 examples uh, without actually doing something complicated? Well, actually it's possible if we will pre-train uh, feature representations of these uh, concepts on some general text data. Uh, so here it's like more shown like what is the difference. Uh, uh, you can think of the distributed representations as uh, some feature vectors that are dense. So the vectors are not orthogonal to each other as is the case in the, uh, of the local features. 
and uh, here we can see that for example like the Prague and Tokyo should be probably close to each other because they are like uh, capital cities while a uh, country uh, should be represented by a vector that is kind of like uh, further away from these. So this is what we would like to obtain and uh, so that's for the motivation. Uh, we would uh, we would want to get uh, these uh, these representations that will capture kind of like similarity between the words, uh, uh, but it shouldn't be just uh, just uh, similarity like um, it shouldn't be just a single degree of similarity because uh, you can of course cluster words using uh, uh, old algorithms like brown clustering, uh, uh, but uh, that uh, doesn't really understand uh, all that much. Uh, one example that I have here is, for example, that uh, there is some similarity between Prague and Berlin because uh, they are related, they are both capital cities, uh, but there is also like a, a relationship between Prague and Czech Republic, which is kind of like a, a different one, but um, again, like Prague and Czech Republic are similar in some way as well. It's just a different way. So we would like to get some representations that would be able to like, uh, not just cluster the words, but to represent these uh, multiple uh, degrees of similarity. Uh, and of course, someone may, may think that uh, probably we will need to build uh, some, uh, some knowledge graph or WordNet, uh, which will require like thousands of annotators and a lot of work and uh, it will have a lot of ambiguity and it will be terribly difficult, but we can actually get something uh, uh, automatically, maybe not with 100% accuracy, but uh, very reasonable for machine learning techniques uh, that still can uh, fix the small mistakes because they are trained uh, for like particular applications. So that's, that was pretty much like the motivation for, uh, for many people who are considering the distributed representations uh, before. Of course, there are like other reasons because there was a lot of like psychological work uh, that uh, was done, I think, by Dav David Rumlehart, uh, like together with Jeff, uh, Jeff Hinton in the 80s, uh, uh, who were thinking that people actually think in this, uh, in this uh, distributed way about concepts. And actually, I will show later in this presentation examples that seem to confirm that uh, their hypothesis uh, was probably correct, that uh, it's, uh, it's about a big part of our thinking. It's like some statistical uh, thinking about, uh, about some distributed representations. And uh, uh, I did uh, develop some simple work when I was uh, uh, writing my master thesis uh, here at the Brno University of Technology in 2007 when I did base these representations on, uh, I did obtain them from a shallow neural network, uh, feed-forward network. Uh, then in uh, 2008, there was like this uh, famous uh, paper from uh, Ronan Colbert and Jason Weston, who were actually trying to use uh, deep networks and they did make like a lot of hype around it actually back then. It was like a big success of deep learning for NLP. Uh, actually, I was uh, slightly skeptical when I did see the paper back then because I did know already that one can get uh, very good representations from the shallow models. So when I did uh, join Google in 2012, I did continue on this work and I wanted to slightly explain what is actually going on and I developed this uh, toolkit that got released in 2013 where I did show some empirical evidence that uh, even the shallow networks can work actually very well and can be actually preferable because they can be optimized much more easily than the deep networks so that people can train them on much more data. I will show that in a while. So the basic architectures there, I used to call them continuous skip gram and continuous back of words, uh, which is like uh, very simple. I will show the figures in a while and that there are uh, two training uh, objectives. Um, <coughs> I will not really explain them in the detail, but uh, they are basically just uh, dealing with, uh, with the classification over a very large number of elements. Uh, and I think the negative sampling is uh, it's really easier to understand and usually works a bit better. So that's maybe what people can consider to use. And then there was a bunch of tricks that I did use to get better performance on like uh, some analogy tasks that I will be showing later. So this is the Skipgram architecture. It's uh, very simple. It's a shallow neural network that has like you know, three layers. Uh, uh, you can see there's like a input layer and projection layer and the output layer. In the Skipgram model, the input layer rep represents the uh, word in a sentence. We pick some word in a sentence, we represent it uh, by one of n code, and then we, uh, we project uh, this word into this continuous space uh, 
in the projection layer and then we try to uh, predict what are the surrounding words uh, in the sentence around this wor word. So it's uh, like a very simple uh, objective. The network just tries to build such representation of words that will be predictive of their context. Of course, one can ask like how long should be the context. Actually, it's a tunable parameter, so people can try to change it for different applications. Actually, different, uh, different uh, widths of the context are optimal, so it's uh, one of the hyperparameters that people should uh, tune. And otherwise, as I said, like uh, uh, we can consider the output layer as like uh, this, uh, this uh, softmax layer over all the words in the vocabulary and we are performing classification there but that would be too complicated computationally so there are like these, uh, these simplifications like the negative sampling that assumes that, uh, that uh, each uh, output neuron is like independent binary classifier and, uh, and that's all so we don't need to evaluate all of them just a positive class and a few negative classes so it's actually very simple. And the continuous vector words architecture is uh, just uh, the pretty much the same model the other way around. Sometimes it works a bit better, sometimes a bit worse. Uh, uh, I don't think that there's any conclusion which, uh, which is actually preferable. It depends on the task uh, and the differences shouldn't be large as long as people tune the other hyperparameters like the number of training epochs. Uh, so in this architecture, one takes the context and tries to predict the middle word by summing together the, the representations of the contextual words. So that's all very simple. After the training is finished, uh, then the matrix between the input layer and the projection layer, or as it is called in the neural network literature, the hidden layer, uh, this, this matrix uh, represents the word feature vectors. So each word uh, then is associated with, say, like 100 dimensional uh, vector float numbers. We can have this like uh, illustration of what uh, what we would want the vectors to look like. Something like uh, when I was talking about these multiple degrees of similarity, like we would like to see that uh, if you have, for example, man, then in some direction the the vector for woman should be in a similar direction as if you go from like king to queen. While if you go like from singular to plural, then the direction should be different, so that's the red arrows here in the picture. So this was actually, this picture is like for illustration, this is not uh, obtained from real data, but later uh, we did actually find that this really uh, holds, even if we would uh, use uh, real data up to some point. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, the resulting uh, representations actually contain surprisingly a lot of syntactic and semantic information. I'm saying surprisingly because uh, I did know for a long time that uh, one can get these uh, like uh, simple regularities, but uh, people can actually try it out themselves, and uh, it's obvious that uh, that um, that the regularities are like uh, very very precise in some cases, uh, more than one would expect. Uh, uh, for example, here I have the example like king minus man vector plus the, plus the woman vector gives approximately to the vector for a queen which was like uh, the famous example that uh, many people did think that it was just hand-picked and ch just some lucky result but it wasn't actually the case like uh, there are many other analogies where uh, one can get a meaningful result. Of course it doesn't work for everything because uh, we are still doing the operations with the vectors so if there's like multiple answers that are valid or uh, some, uh, some other mapping that is not one-to-one -one, then it's not gonna work well. But for many analogies one can actually use uh, this, uh, this simple uh, vector calculation which uh, did motivate us to develop uh, automatic uh, test set that would uh, measure how well one can do on uh, the analogies, uh, uh, there's like a public test set with about 20,000 analogy que questions, but with the semantic and syntactic part. And uh, we did compare the new models, like the Vortovec models, with the uh, prior state of the art models uh, that were based on the neural net language models. This was what we published like uh, three years ago. and. Uh, Many people were actually excited about the training speed that uh, what used to take like weeks or months, uh, uh, now it's possible to do it basically in seconds because uh, and minutes if you want to get much better accuracy. One can really see that the prior models uh, were like very low in the accuracy, like uh, two or 11% accuracy on these analogies. So they didn't really work well for this task. Uh, they were trained on small amount of data and with small dimensional vectors. 
And once uh, the architecture of the neural net language model was simplified to this uh, simple like Skipgram or SIBO, then it actually became much more easy to train these models on like uh, way more data and way more quickly. So now I think the state of the art result on this analogy data is, uh, is about like 83%. Uh, and one can definitely get in a few seconds to better result than whatever was like this pre-2013 models. Uh, for like some examples, just to show like uh, how it uh, used to look like when we did show it in the paper, like uh, it's it's quite interesting that you can get like uh, some funny examples, like you can take a vector for like sushi and uh, subtract Japan and uh, Germany, and you will get like breadwurst. Uh, so and uh, many others. Of course, it doesn't work uh, in every case, but if you uh, if you um, like make a list of like uh, top 10 or top 20 nearest neighbors, then actually uh, it's looking uh, usually quite reasonable, especially the model was uh, trained on a lot of data that was actually very important here. So I think that there's some message in this that, uh, that uh, one can really get uh, a lot of interesting results even with uh, very shallow statistics, because if I would go back to the models, like if you look at it, uh, this model definitely doesn't look like a model that can understand the language. It's not like a model that can, that is, uh, that one can build like artificial intelligence around. Like uh, it really just understands the coherence of words, and that's all that it does. And still, it can produce uh, these uh, these interesting analogy examples that uh, many people, when they did see them, didn't really believe them until they tried it themselves. That it really works. Uh, it's not fake. Uh, thank you. So, um, I think uh, one of the messages that. Uh, uh, I would like to make is that uh, the statistical learning can be much uh, better than people expect in some respects. Uh, and uh, if I would obtain, for example, these results from some like LSTML with 20 hidden errors, I think it would be much more confusing. And some people would maybe believe that, uh, that this is like a model that understands the language and uh, it's a model of artificial intelligence, but it's not. I think people should be a little bit skeptical, even if they, when they see cool results like that. Uh, uh, they should be asking whether it can be obtained from simpler models. So, uh, so that's actually the case. Here is just a visualization by using PCA that really shows that there is this structure in the uh, in the word vector space uh, that if you plot uh, vectors that represent the uh, capital uh, cities and countries, that uh, the the gray lines are actually something that we edit ourselves. But uh, but the position of the words. Uh, of the vectors, you can actually see that uh, they actually copy a lot of structure, like Asian countries are in some place and uh, Central European countries in some other place, Southern Euro European countries are elsewhere, and then the capital cities basically copy this position. And that's actually after re reduction of these like 300 dimensional vectors into two dimensional space. So a lot of information is lost and still there's a lot of this structure that uh, remains. So for the summary and discussion about this, uh, war to uh, models. Uh, the, in my opinion, the main reason why people did consider this very useful is because uh, of the speed up of the training, like compared to the prior work, uh, it was really more than 10,000 times faster to obtain uh, features that were actually even better than the pr previous ones. Uh, now, like today, I think uh, pretty much all the big IT companies that I know of are using uh, these uh, features in like plenty of applications because it's very easy. One can just uh, plug in these features into whatever classifier people have, whether they are working on search, uh, as Google published last year, they are using similar approaches to improve Google search or like ads recommendation and so on. Uh, also like for the research community, these models are very interesting because they can also boost performance of many NLP tasks. These features are so simple that uh, that really like people can use them pretty much everywhere. And then also like uh, I did see some successful use cases for non-NLP applications where people use uh, use the word to like uh, to compute uh, feature representations of uh, of other data than just uh, than just the words or text. Of course, there was some follow-up work. Uh, there was this interesting paper that uh, uh, that showed that uh, these neural net-based models are actually very related to the traditional distributional semantics models that actually I wasn't aware of. My main motivation for word 2 vec was to show that uh, shallow models can work very well and we don't really need deep learning for everything. Uh, and it's good to understand what the models are doing because then we can actually optimize uh, them much better. 
And it turned out actually that uh, these traditional distribution semantics models uh, were not as good as word to wake uh, across uh, quite a few tasks that uh, Marco Baroni and his students uh, did try. So I think we were kind of lucky with this because uh, we should have been done this comparison ourselves, but it turned out to be good for us. Then there was uh, this other follow-up work that uh, was also like very well known, like it's called GLOV. Uh, in my opinion, it's just like a, another version of word to wake from Stanford, uh, but at least they have their own uh, name. And uh, in my opinion, it's slightly like uh, going back uh, backwards because instead of like uh, computing these uh, word features uh, using a single model, they actually uh, have a two-step uh, two-step algorithm. That first they gather the counts, uh, which can be actually huge in the memory, and then they do the damage to reduction. So I was slightly confused by their claims that it's superior in performance, uh, but it turned out to be not really. Uh, true, because there was this follow-up work from Omar Levy and Jab Goldberg uh, uh, about uh, about like this uh, this comparison when the models are actually trained on the same data, which is something that uh, the authors of GLOB didn't do. They did actually compare models trained on different data, which I think uh, is not uh, something that machine learning people should be even doing. Uh, and when when the comparison was done, it was actually shown the, that the word to work, uh, the original one was like faster and better. So. Uh, and uh, like other people did come up with similar conclusions. So I think these are like the most uh, most uh, uh, significant uh, or in the case of GLOV overhyped works that I did uh, see later. Uh, we shall see if there will be some interesting progress in 2016. Um, but this is I think where we are now with these uh, word features. So for the final notes, uh, I think that the main reason of, uh, of uh, the word to like popularity is because it's simple and uh, um, it's uh, it's useful, but uh, I would also like uh, say that people shouldn't try to use it everywhere. Like the same as with deep learning, it's not solution for everything. Uh, for example, I did see in several papers that people try to sum word vectors from like uh, sentences uh, to form sentence representations, but that actually doesn't work well. And I think we did uh, warn about it even in the papers, but still people try to do it as a baseline, and it's actually not a good baseline. Uh, even back of words would be actually much better. I, I think back of words is baseline, it is often missing actually. For modeling sequences, I would rather recommend the recurrent networks like the ARN and LM that I used to work on in my, during my PhD at the Bern University. And uh, then of course, like uh, I would say that there's often like these cases where some results get overhyped, like as I said, uh, first motivation for word to vague was to reduce this hype about these deep embeddings and uh, uh, thank you. And I think that uh, uh, this uh, word to wake was able to like uh, solve this a bit. So, uh, and then there's like final references. So thank you for attention. And uh, if you have any questions, you can ask me. Thank you very much for your talk. And now questions. Hi. Uh, thanks a lot for the speech. I wanted to ask you today. We have seen uh, like examples of machine learning where you can like uh, prevent or like early early diagnosis of the disease. And so I wanted to understand what's what's the use case of things you have shown and what is the vision of the term? What is the uh, future? The, the, what, what is the future? Yeah. What is the vision? What is the vision of, of this application? As I said, like. Ask me where is it used? Like as I said, like it's used in a lot of actually applications. Like uh, mm -hmm. as I said, like if you know Google search, maybe uh, that people very well. Like uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, vision are up. The idea for the future, like something that really can can be helpful. Now it's very good that it's related to what you're writing, and that's good. But is there something that uh, can be developed and be more even more useful? I mean, uh, like better in the future. Yeah. Uh, well, that's what, of course, people are trying to do uh, pretty much all the time. You can consider a lot of tricks how to get uh, more information to these models. For example, you can consider morphological information uh, to be part of, so, say, the input layer or the output layer or both to get more information about the board. So, uh, so that's one possibility. But uh, usually, especially in the case of English, if you go to a huge data sets and you can do like train models on, like, say, hundreds of millions of words, then uh, it can kind of like uh, understand the morphology. Uh, even like uh, without the input, uh, the input. So that's that's what the linguistic algorithms that I was showing uh, are about. Like you can share here. And we have, for example, this example like 
figure minus the data plus code uh, equals the folder. Uh, it's clear that now Honor sends uh, this kind of like, mm, like the kind of fragments to the board, uh, boards. And that's, that's because uh, it was trained on a lot of data. So I would say using extra features, uh, especially morphological features, will help you if you use more data. If you go to a very large data set, then in a for case uh, for English, it's not that useful. For our languages, I think that the next thing is uh, that people should definitely be doing is to use morphological features, which can be very basic. It can be like in ground characters that they will be just in the model. So uh, that's that's one simple feature. Do you think it would be possible to transform the vector space in such a way that the individual positions of the vector would express, say, the object size, geographical location, the human interpretable features? Well, I think that if uh, at least some slight supervision is maybe doable, like uh, the other interesting thing about the works of vectors is that it's probably unsupervised, that you don't need to provide any labels and you can just train these models. Uh, a lot of data and then you as a uh, like human interpret the, for example, the quality of the vectors by seeing the like, uh, nearest neighbors or the analogy things. If you would uh, consider uh, using some slightly supervised training where you would, uh, for example, try to annotate uh, what some groups of words means, then you can maybe really construct uh, automatically some noisy versions of knowledge graphs uh, <coughs> just uh, through some annotated, through few annotations actually be naming uh, groups of objects like uh, for example capital cities. You can have like positive examples, negative examples and very quickly you can actually get a pretty good list of uh, objects uh, this way in a very slightly supervised way. I know, but I thought whether it would be possible to um, secondary edit uh, the reason of the vector space to to make, say, the second position uh, expressing whether it is capacity or not. Yes, yeah, so that, that goes back to like uh, this concept of distributed or distributed representation, which I was showing. You. And you're like, if you're asking about like, uh, what does the first number mean? Uh, because the meaning is distributed across the whole space. It uh, doesn't really mean anything by itself. Uh, uh, the meaning is distributed across the whole vector. Uh, so it's it's not like uh, uh, even if, for example, this concept of capital cities they will be like kind of like blob in this dimensional space, it's not going to be just one coordinate of the model. So if you want to have it more like, uh, uh, I guess you have to uh, you would need some extra supervision. But uh, these models are like about these distributed features uh, that only by definition uh, says that uh, the representations are distributed across uh, across the space. I know they are distributed, but using some uh, rotations of the space and... Uh, maybe it's a rotation of the space, but then you need that extra version that I was talking about. Okay. <laughs> um, your last slide mentions... Your last slide mentions uh, the interesting question of representing sentences. Um, would you recommend using word to back for sentences at all? And if not, what would you recommend? It really depends on the application. Like, uh, if you want to get a representation of sentences, there was like a, one very successful example from the New York University. I think uh, it was uh, Yoon Kim's work a few years ago, who used the uh, convolution <coughs> networks uh, on top of the pre chain word vectors. Uh, that was like giving you state of the art results. So, it was a combination of pre-trained word vectors and the convolution networks that were trained uh, supervised data for tasks. So in this case, it's very good, like a huge unsupervised uh, text that you can pretend to be trained vectors on, and they have these small labeled uh, uh, data set like sentiment analysis or whatever people were using back then. Uh, then uh, this pre-training will help you. If you have a huge uh, labeled data set, then uh, I don't think you actually work with it will help you because then you can just uh, build the normal way. So if you have like this mismatch between like the sites, you have huge unlabeled data and small label data, then sure it can help you. But not just with summing the variables, you should be using this kind of 
Okay, we are out of time, so thank you very much.